أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز قولا عظيما أما بعد We praise, we start in praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abundant praise and we beseech him to send his peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his family, his companions and his followers until the end of time. Amin ya rabbal alameen. Today brothers and sisters is considered to be the birthday of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we understand that there are differing opinions in celebrating this day to ease the hearts, wanting to reflect upon three of the reasons why some will celebrate the Mawlid, the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. The first being that the Prophet ﷺ, he was reportedly, he reportedly mentioned that on his birthday he would fast, showing that it was a day of significance. Secondly, that the Prophet ﷺ himself performed his aqiqah, the only one that we know of that celebrated two aqiqahs. And he celebrated his own in Medina to also teach us that we should be honoring this day. And majority of our scholars agree upon his practice, celebrating the mawlid as long as it is, as it is done in good niyyah. In celebrating the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, you notice in cultures, in societies, you have days to commemorate historical figures, people that made a significant impact in the society they live. You find in our society we have MLK Day, Martin Luther King. In the Indian society they have Gandhi Jayanti Day, honoring Mahatma Gandhi. And people will reflect on their successes, they will reflect upon what they have done for the society. SubhanAllah, how do you honor a man like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man who changed the course of human history as we know it? A man who was known to be the most influential person in all of human history. A day doesn't do it, but we remind ourselves at the very least on this day. So where do you start? You start with honoring the Prophet Sallallahu as he was honored by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the 68th chapter of the Quran, he says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ نون والقلم وما يسطرون ما أنت بنعمة ربك بمجنون وإن لك لأجر غير ممنون وإنك لعلى خلق عظيم. Allah سبحانه وتعالى talking about the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. He says he صلى الله عليه وسلم is على خلق عظيم. That he is on great character. And in the Arabic language, you don't, you use the, the word ala or on with something that is tangible. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He uses ala on an intangible, good character, great character. And you find that He teaches us something tremendous through that simple word, ala. He teaches us that the Prophet sallallahu was a person that was excellent in his character. That he was in control of his character. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to know that 
the Prophet وسلم, had mastered good character to the extent that he made an intangible into a tangible. It's like to say that good character, character itself is a mountain. And on top of that mountain, the peak of that mountain, the summit of that mountain, stands the Prophet And you find that all of the good in this ummah today is because the Prophet Wasallam's efforts. You find when teenagers come to this religion, when you find that people cry and come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you find that people are, are strongly desired to raise their children with God consciousness, you find the programs and events across the nation, across the world, all of that good that we see, all of that khair, all of that awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is done in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we realize that it is a drop in the bah, the ocean of who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was. The scholars, they mentioned about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and his prophethood. And they said that if you were to strip away all of the divine proofs that he sallallahu alayhi wa is a prophet of God, they said that if you own, if you strip that all away, you can still prove that he is the prophet of Allah, the prophet of God because of the people that surrounded themselves with him. The change he made with the people around him, his companions, his community. And when you reflect upon their lives, you find regardless of their path to the Prophet regardless of how they came to the Prophet the moment they opened their hearts to the Prophet, their lives were dramatically changed, dramatically altered. And today, I wanted to reflect upon two of those companions for us to remember our beloved Prophet on this day of his birth. The first is a very well-known companion Zayd ibn Haritha, the one who put the Prophet وسلم, in his home before he even was a Prophet. Originally, Zayd was from one of the tribes of Yemen. And he, his father and mother belonged to two different tribes in that area. And it was known that their tribes would have a love-hate relationship. And one day his mother took him to visit her tribe, her family. And during that time they were visiting, there was a conflict between the two tribes. And it was reported that her own tribesmen took Zayd without her knowing, without her husband knowing, the father, and they took him to the Arqad and they sold him in slavery as revenge of what was going on between the two tribes. One thing we know that he was of age to be a slave boy, so he had enough memory to remember his parents. They sold him, and the person who bought him was Hakim ibn Hazm, who was the nephew of Khadija radiallahu anha. He was going to buy a slave for her in her home. Hakim, he purchases Zayd, and now he is in the home of Khadija radiallahu anha. Some time passes and she marries a young man by the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as a wedding gift, she gives him this young slave boy Zayd as his servant. During this time, Zayd's father never gives up. He continues to look for his son the minute he leaves. The minute he is kidnapped, he is constantly looking for his son. And as he is looking for his son, he's spreading the word. And one of the men from his tribe, his area, they go for the pilgrimage. And they see Zayd. And they notice Zayd is different. And they notice that that might be his son. So they return, one man returns from the pilgrimage and he tells Haritha that I have seen your son 
He is in Mecca. He is with the grandson of uh, Abdul Muttalib. So Haritha immediately, he takes as much money as he can. He takes his brother with him and they go. When they arrive in Mecca, they look for a man named Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mind you, this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before Prophet. They find the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Haram and they approach him and they tell him, the father mentions to him, you're, you're from a great tribe, the Quraysh, you are the leaders, you are the trustworthy, you are of great lineage. And he tells him, he kind of butters him up and he tells him, please give me my son and I'll pay as much as I can. Mind you, during this time, there's no law and order. Really, ultimately, the authority lies with those who have the money and who have the power. So it's not like he could have gone to court and, and, and gotten his son back. He had to go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he said something. In response to Haritha request to buy his son back, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, it's not, I leave it up to him. I leave it up to Zayd, and if he chooses to go with you, you owe me nothing. You have to pay nothing. If he chooses me, then I cannot turn away somebody who wants to be with me. <coughs> now Zayd is around 25 years of age. When he was taken from his family, he was a young boy, but enough, old enough to remember. So they called Zayd. Zayd comes. And Zayd is given the option. Stay here, go with your father. Zayd responds and says, I have seen, I, 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 I have not seen anyone like this man, the Prophet. For I can never choose anyone over him. To his father. And then he says to the Prophet, you are to me more than a father and an uncle combined. This is an unnatural choice. The natural choice is our father. The natural choice is our mother. What Zayd does is he chooses the unnatural path. We are inclined towards our parents. His father responds and he tells him, are you crazy? You want to be a slave rather than a free man? You don't want to go home to your family, you want to stay here. And Zayd, he responds and he says, Yes, I cannot choose anyone over this man. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at that very moment, he stands. People are around. He brings the people closer and he tells them, O oh, people of Mecca, I want, you, I want to testify in front of you that Zayd is now a free man and he is now my son. And from then on he was called Zayd ibn Muhammad. And you would think, why did the Prophet do that? In that moment, why does he stand and proclaim his freedom and that he's his son? Was that insensitive? You, you, in reality, you find that the Prophet Sallallahu response was not selfish, but selfless. His father, a few minutes earlier, said, you're going to be a slave. As a father, that would hurt. The Prophet immediately wants his father to know that your son is fine. He will be a free man. He will be an equal in society. He will not be mistreated. He is left, he's out of slavery. And how he is with a noble tribe, as the father mentioned to the Prophet ﷺ just moments before. Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn Khattab, he mentioned that all the years he knew Zayd, he only knew him as Zayd ibn Muhammad. Until the fifth year after Hijri, which is about, what, 18 years after Prophethood? He said, until then, until a verse was revealed in the 35th chapter of the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala required 
the children hold their father's name. And not until that moment did he know that it was not Zayd ibn Muhammad, but it was Zayd ibn Haritha. When you think about Zayd choosing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa over his father, it's mind-blowing. It's, it's incredible. It's unnatural. Mind you, a time when the Prophet was not a Prophet. It was not out of religious commitment, but rather out of who that man was. The second, the story of Safwan ibn Umayyah. <coughs> Safwan ibn Umayyah, 20 years after Prophethood, approximately 20 years after Prophethood, he's fighting alongside the Muslims at a battle of uh, Hunayn. He is not yet a Muslim. 20 years after, he's fighting alongside the Muslim. And, he, and the reason he's fighting is he tells them, I'm not going to be a Muslim, but I don't, I'd rather a Qurayshi as my leader than somebody from Hunayn. So that's why he's fighting. The Muslims gain victory. After achieving victory, he's riding along back, along the foothills of the desert, he's coming back home. And Safwan, he begins to think to himself that he would ne he could never have imagined that he would be fighting alongside Muslims. He's still not a Muslim. He is surprised at where he's at today, that he's fighting alongside the Muslims. In fact, just a few weeks ago, he was one of only three people who refused to surrender at Qat Mecca, at the opening of Mecca. He was one of three people that left and would not stay because the Muslims had conquered Mecca. And he is sitting there reflecting, thinking, what happened? 20 years ago, or, or years before, not 20, but few years before, Safwan reflects upon how his father and brother passed away in the Battle of Badr. And how that created a sense of revenge and hatred in him for Islam and the Prophet wasallam. And he reflects as he's writing. He reflects on because of that, he made a commitment after his father and brother are killed to go and assassinate the Prophet. And he makes a plan with his cousin Umayyad. And he is reflecting that they went and they had a failed attempt at assassinating the Prophet wasallam. But that wasn't the part that hurt the most. During their attempt to assassinate the Prophet, his companion Umayyad becomes Muslim. The one who was going to strike those swords becomes Muslim. Safwan leaves alone. His hatred rises. He is a big proponent for the Battle of Uhud. He spends money, fundraises for it. He pays a well-known poet to rile up the people. He reflects. He reflects after Uhud how he captures one of the Muslims by the name of Zayd ibn Dathinna and he has him killed. He has him killed at the hands of Abu Sufyan. And Abu Sufyan, before he kills Zayd, he tells him, don't you wish Zayd that it was Muhammad that was here and you were with your family at home? about to be killed. Zayd responds and he says, I would not wish so much as a thorn pick on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi Even if it would take me to my family. After Abu Sufyan has him killed, Abu Sufyan, he reflects. And he says about Zayd, he remarks, I never saw anyone as completely loved as Muhammad's companions loved him. Safwani continues to reflect the 20 years of hatred 
as he rides. He thinks of Khalid ibn Awalid after he becomes a Muslim, how he encouraged Safwan to become a Muslim. And he, Safwan remembers what he said to Khalid. He remembers, he tells Khalid that even if I were the lone Quraysh left, I would not convert to this religion. He continues to reflect during the minor pilgrimage of the, of the Muslims. He reflects when Bilal was making the call for prayer to the Muslims that Safwan remembered what he said to himself. And he exclaimed, Praise God for not letting my father be here to witness this, to see this happening, the Muslims here. Safwan continues to reflect all of this hatred that he's had. Still not a Muslim. He reflects on him fleeing when the Muslims conquered Mecca, going to Jeddah and getting on a boat to go to Yemen. And those times getting on a boat was like 10% chance. It was like, you're not going to make it most likely. But he knew that was the only choice he could make. He would, did not want to be there. And he was also very fearful that from all that has been done, all the inten uh, intentions and assassination and hatred he's had, that Muhammad وسلم, would, not, would, would have him killed. So he took off. His cousin Umayyad, the one who was supposed to assassinate the Prophet with, he tells the Prophet وسلم, to please give safety to Safwan. The Prophet وسلم, he grants it and he gives him his his, uh, uh, his, his, uh, what is that called? His turban, Zakhlaqir. He gives him his turban, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, take this to him to show him that you will be trusted. He will be safe. The same turban that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wears when he's entering Mecca. So everyone knows what it looks like. He goes to Safwan as he's getting on the boat. He tells him, what are you doing? You're making a bad choice, stay. Safwan says, are you crazy? I'm going to be killed. Umayyad tells him, no, you will be fine. Here, look. He is guaranteed, Muhammad sallallahu has guaranteed your safety. Come back with me. He comes back with him. He assesses the situation, Safwan, and he thinks, might as well go back to the hard and survive on the boat trip anyway. He goes back and he, the Prophet sallallahu guarantees him his safety. Safwan doesn't stop there. Safwan tells him, I need two months to see if I want to be Muslim or not. The Prophet sallallahu he responds to him, he said, you have four months. And he begins to live amongst the people. And he's reflecting, riding in the desert, reflecting. He thinks back, he thinks back to when during that time, him being among the community, they are going to go fight the battle of Hunayn. And he says, I want to fight with you because I want a Quraysh to lead me. And he goes and he fights and they win. And now he's writing back. And he's thinking that Allah is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's thinking that he's given me 100 camels from, the, from these spoils of war. And he gave nothing to the closest companion. And he's riding along and he sees a, a large flock of livestock that belong to those who they just defeated in war. Who was up for the grab, up for grabs. And as he's riding, a voice from behind him says, is it pleasing to you? Safwan turns and he sees it's the Prophet sallallahu and he's embarrassed. He doesn't want to say anything. He doesn't say anything, but it shows on his face what he wants, that I would like that. The Prophet sallallahu without Safwan saying anything, he says it's yours. He thinks 20 years of hatred. He thinks after 20 years of hatred, I've given four months to contemplate upon a Muslim. I've been given a hundred camels and I've been given this large lifestyle. 
and he turns to the Prophet and he says, I bear witness that there is no soul, there is no soul could have such goodness in them if it were not for somebody who is the Prophet of God. And he accepts this now. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله ولكم تستغفر إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت وسلمت وباركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد. The stories of the companions they point to one of the timeless truths of the Sira of the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. It points to the fact that the companions were attracted to the Prophet because of how he touched their lives and inspired them to achieve it. If the companions were with us today, as mentioned by Miraj Muhyuddin in his own opinion, who wrote the Sira book, Revelation, the life of Muhammad, the story of Muhammad, if the companions were with us today, he writes, the greatest achievement they would have told us that their greatest achievement did not come because they happened to be a part of the Prophet's life. But rather because the Prophet was an integral part of theirs. Maraj mentioned something really remarkable regarding this life of this man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which I cannot give justice if, unless I read it word for word. Maraj, he says, personally reflecting, trying to learn the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Maraj, he writes, he says, for the past 13 years, I've been trying to unlock the secret to this relationship. In the end, I realized something remarkable. The seerah is a love song. It is about taking your heart and making it bigger. The bigger it gets, the more it gives. The more it gives, the bigger it gets. This is the story of Prophet Muhammad and his companions and, it, it, and it's the singular reason they are considered to be the greatest generation. It wasn't about following rules. He concludes with this profound statement. It wasn't about following rules. It was about falling in love. We celebrate this day of Mawlid we celebrate the birthday of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to reflect upon the man who connects us with our Lord. It reminds us how important it is to engage in his life, to understand his life. Because it's not about following rules as you see in many of the companions' lives. It was about falling in love. And by falling in love, you find, you find him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you find your creator. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to walk in the footsteps of our beloved Prophet. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our shortcomings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower upon us his mercy. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our major and minor sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us the time that we have spent today on our scale of good deeds. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide the family members of ours who have not yet been guided. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the family members of ours who have passed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our community. So allow us to be those who hold Islam as it should be held. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts to Quran and to live Quran as it should be lived. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the children in this community. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make them leaders and to make them leaders of our community and the society at large. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless their sound. 
to bless the sound that they make when we are in Jum'ah because it reminds us that that is the blessing. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create love and harmony amongst one another. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us an exemplary community based in the prophetic tradition. اللهم اهدنا فيمن هديت واعطنا فيمن عافيت وتولنا فيمن توليت وبارك لنا فيمن اعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا ما شر ما فديت فانه لا يذل ما وليت ولا يعز من عديت تباركت ربنا وتعالى With that, uh, we just one announcement inshallah We are celebrating our Friday evening program Sheikh Suhail will be uh, at the masjid this evening from 7 o'clock onwards We will be celebrating the Mawlid Inshallah also Qadi Talib will be there as well to uh, recite some uh, uh, nasheed. So please join us tonight inshallah. And the next two Tuesdays, we will have a two-part series on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his, the, the special qualities that were given only to him as the Prophet of Allah. Join us with Sheikh Suhail those next two Tuesdays from 7 o'clock onwards. And of course, all our other programs, view them on our newsletter. Okay, so